are presiding over these uh, hugely important cases. And it is tough in any system in which there's a commission and a merit-based appointment by the governor or whomever uh, to get by with unqualified people on the bench. Uh, if, to me, that's uh, very, very important. You've got qualified people, then they know their role as a judge is not uh, the same as a politician. Their role as a judge is to get into the middle of this statute or this insurance policy or the common law and figure out what the right answer is with respect to um, paying respect to precedent from the U.S. Supreme Court or their Supreme Court uh, in that state, or with respect to the independent branches of government and the limited role the judiciary plays. If you get that sort of person, that qualified person on the bench, then you're get getting a long way toward bringing confidence back into the way we handle our civil and criminal disputes. Just one more question and then um, open up to the audience. Professor Sample, if I heard you right, you said it's been more than 20 years since a state has gone from electing judges to a merit system. Uh, uh, what are you concerned about? What are you hopeful about for the next five or ten years in that regard? Well, the, the concern, and that, that's a reference to New Mexico, which made that move in 1988, and for those who are real insiders in judicial selection, New Mexico's system is a sort of unique hybrid. It's hardly, it involves an initial appointment and subsequent both retention elections and in some instances contested elections, so it's hardly a resounding rejection of uh, judicial elections writ large. So the concern is really uh, that this has proven to be a very tough mountain to climb. Uh, my understanding, and, and certainly what, as Justice O'Connor indicated earlier today, is that the polls in Nevada are now uh, very close. They were, act the, the merit selection proposal was trailing in the polls for some time, and she made yet another trip out to Nevada uh, in recent weeks, and there's been what you might call a Justice O'Connor bounce. Uh, for the effort. So uh, in terms of hopefulness, I mean, I think there is, a, there is thinking out there that there can be a meaningful move and that there's progress being made towards appointment systems in some states. But you will also meet chief justices from, and, and justices from the state courts around the country who will tell you that in their state, the answer is never, no way, and it's not going to happen. Uh, and that is, in my view, a clarion call for us not to ignore what we can do on a more incremental level. Thank you so much. Um, we'll start taking questions from the audience. If you don't mind introducing yourself and who you're with. Yes, ma'am. Uh, my name is Paula Stern, and I'm a member of the Committee for Economic Development and a non-lawyer. Um, Good for you. Though, as I, yeah. I, I said <laughs> earlier um, in the conversation before lunch, um, I served for nine years on a quasi-judicial agency, the International Trade Commission. Uh, it was a nine-year appointment, and you could not get reappointed. Um, but my question as a non-lawyer to all of these experts here is, is there a scenario where um, there could be a court case ultimately tested and um, accepted for review uh, by the Supreme Court uh, of a decision, uh, say, that involved a foreign corporation who uh, came before a court and felt that somehow it was prejudiced because the judge or the bank of judges, the majority, um, were elected, and that somehow there, the due process was um, uh, trampled on. I mean, I, I'm just throwing out, you know, it's not a good uh, thought, but I just want to know if anyone has thought of a scenario where something like this would get to the, a Supreme Court consideration. Professor probably has. <laughs> well, I think Trevor's probably thought of that more than anyone, but I th I, it's a good question, and I think that um, I, I think the answer in terms of the thrust of your question may strike you as unfortunate. Uh, but the fact is that 39 states elect some of their judges, and that as much as the Founding Fathers didn't choose it for the federal system, in many instances, judicial elections, though we might not think of them in, that, in these terms, came about as part of the progressive era as a way to take the politics out of the clubhouse, as it were. And 
the, court, the Supreme Court has addressed judicial elections even in the last decade alone, starting in 2002 in Republican <laughs> Party of Minnesota v. White, then in a case involving a very Byzantine system uh, in New York State that involves elections, and then again in the Caperton case three times in just the last eight years. And in each of those in opinions, the court made it clear that fundamentally uh, it will not it has no interest in and would not be uh, amenable to a, a categorical frontal attack on the process of electing judges as a constitutional basis. Yeah, I think that's right. That the court is, I think, un, the specific questions. I think the court is unlikely to say that the election of judges violates the due process clause of the federal constitution. Mm -hmm. However, uh, in all these cases, when you have facts like this that turn up, I, I think you can see the court saying it does present real ethical issues, conflict of interest issues. Yes. And in that sense, I think you could see that there's probably going to be a, con a tension here. On the one hand, you have the Caperton decision, you have an obvious concern by the court with facts like that, facts like you're describing. On the other hand, they're going to be reluctant, I think, uh, to end up uh, having uh, to promote litigation in every case where someone can say, uh, the judge was biased against me because they received a penny from a contributor who could benefit from the outcome. So where those standards are set is, I think, the next battleground. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, one more question. Mr. Coleman, can we get a mic over there? Uh, can I sit down? No. It's okay. Here comes the mic. Uh, yeah. I've been very impressed by this presentation, and I can't say whether I agree with it or don't. But I'd hope that somehow I would hear something which say that a guy like Torney would not have sat in the Dred Scott case, or that Plessy versus Ferguson would have come out the other way. Now, the Torney case, the fact is that uh, the Chief Justice Earl Warren told me, coming back one day from Atchison's Farm, that uh, Johnson wanted somebody else. He wanted a man named John R. Carroll. And he called him over from Baltimore and said, I want to appoint you not only justice, but chief justice. And Carol immediately says, no, I can't take it. And the president said, well, I can't understand why. You don't have to work about uh, two thirds of a year. You're only 40 miles away. And he said, well, if you're living with a woman that you're not willing to marry her or get rid of her, I don't think you should take this job. So as a result of that, we got torty. And that's a true story. So, and 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 secondly, I, I I think that you know the 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 selection system of, of, by the president has not always worked with the best person in getting the job. There have been a lot of instances where the person that got it would not be the person that I would have selected. You know, certainly by everything in the game, Bob Boric should have been put on the court. Unfortunately for him, I was at the cabinet at the time, and he wanted to take a position in a Boston school case where even though the court had said that you had to integrate the schools, the white kids did not have to whip, arrive more than six miles. And when he would have walked in and leave, everybody wanted that. And I stood up and said, doesn't make sense. Unfortunately, Nelson Rockefeller got. In that case, the Supreme Court did not take uh, a position I mean, the, the, the court did not take a position. Uh, you know, the Solicitor General did not take a position, and therefore cert was denied, and that's why the Boston schools are better than they were before. So, you know, there are complicated issues having nothing to do with you got a very important company who's making a lot of money and has a case before it and tries to do it. Uh, my, you know, experience has been that most people that get on the courts you know, they are the court, they act differently. And you might catch one in a million that does it. What I'd hate to put my money on is the area of justice or the Supreme Court that did decide the case the way I would have decided it because he had some other reason. And I think it's true of state judges too. Thank you, sir. Final word from Mr. Caperton. Well, um, <laughs> The, um, I think I was probably that one in a million case. Only so, you were three and five. Uh, yeah, it was three and <laughs> three and five, three in a million case, and so uh, you know from that standpoint, uh, 
you know, the, the biggest, I think the biggest problem I had in the whole thing with Justice Benjamin is, is that he didn't follow the rules for recusal. And if he would have followed those rules and, and not put his own standard in, but the standard of which is a reasonable, reasonable person uh, standard, then he would have recused himself. And I think that's probably, fortunately, we're here today, unfortunately for me, but fortunately for this cause, we're here today because of Justice Benjamin's actions. And, and Chief Justice Jefferson, the last word to you, sir. I was just going to say that's a, an excellent point. Uh, Justice O'Connor made it as well. Um, it's you know, you, sometimes you need judges who have courage in, in states where uh, they are elected and they know, as a, I, mean, I mean, it's clear as day that uh, the decision I make today is not going to be popular and the headlines are not going to be good. Uh, the electorate is not going to like it, but the Constitution requires it. What do you do in those, in those cases? Or the people who contributed to your campaigns are going to be mad. What do you do? Um, you know, the, and the answer is you've got to, you, you know, you, you, you swore an oath uh, to preserve, protect, and defend the constitutional laws of the United States and your state. Um, those are the kinds of people you want on the bench. Um, and they're not guaranteed through an elected system, electoral system, and you're right. They're not guaranteed necessarily uh, in a system um, where they are appointed. Uh, these Profiles and Courage Award ought to go to the judges who do the right thing, uh, no matter what, what the law is. Um, so first, please join me in thanking an excellent panel to finish up our day. So thank you again to the panelists, to the authors. Um, thanks to all of you for joining us today Justice O'Connor also sent her thanks to everyone for joining us today. As uh, Mr. Caperton sent, said a minute ago, this is a cause. Um, and I hope everyone has um, learned enough to be scared and uh, understood that there's an enormous amount going on um, being done by a lot of individuals, a lot of organizations. Um, we would love to help you learn more about it. We would love to work with you. We would love to stay in touch with you. Thank you very much for coming and joining us today. <laughs>